Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Eric Townell. My guest today is Thomas Warfield, multifaceted artist and director of dance at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Thank you so much for coming in. Oh, Thomas. Thanks for oh, having me, Eric. It's yeah, wonderful it's to be delightful. here. And uh, so I noticed that uh, in your write-up on the RIT website, it mentions a wide and vast career in poetry <laughs> and music and, and dance. and so. How did we get to where we are today? Oh gosh, what a story. Well, you know, I, uh, I've had a very deeply blessed life mm -hmm. uh, and I'm grateful for it. Um, I, I, it's been a little unconventional and I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, when I was in college, I, was, I went to State University of New York at Purchase. Well, that was the, that was the college I finally ended up at, <laughs> after a few others. Uh -huh. But um, I was a dance major, and uh, I uh, was thinking afterwards, you know, go into a dance company there in New York. And, uh, but somehow it didn't work that way. I, we had uh, made a tour, the dance company at school had made a tour to Asia, to Macau and Hong Kong. And uh, I was fascinated by it. And the company, one of the companies in Hong Kong invited me to come and join their company when I graduated. And I said, OK. <laughs> so I left New York um, and went to Asia. And uh, it was really um, eye-opening is not quite the right description. It was a little more uh, as though life somehow opened this door and I just walked into it. And my life has kind of been like that. I have a real strong internal voice that I follow. And no matter what the external circumstances, I continue to just, and it's really served me well. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, to make this story short, I um, eventually uh, did other companies in Asia and then Europe uh, mm -hmm. for a long time, mm -hmm. and then came back to the States uh, to go to grad school at University of Utah. Uh -huh. um, and while I was there, I created an organization, a student group there called Dance Art. And it was about bringing all the uh, fine art uh, schools there, all the students together, and to create um, projects around social activism. So the first project we did there actually was raise money for the uh, Romanian orphans that oh, yes. were affected with AIDS. This was right at uh, the time the Berlin Wall had just come down. Big story, yes. Uh -huh. And I saw this on a 2020 one night, and I was just, I was just, I was weeping watching mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my God, what can I do, you know? And what could we do? Well, we could raise money and help. So we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually that organization grew into a nonprofit called Peace Art. And um, the impetus uh, for Peace Art really goes back to some of my time in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, one time I was performing and uh, I, uh, when, the, when the performances tour was over, I toured around on my own, which I, I love to do that in countries where I can't, I don't know anything. I don't know. <laughs> it's funny. It's a, you know, you think you're lost and everything, but actually you're never really lost because you're always somewhere. You just don't know where that is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, would, I got on a train going somewhere because I couldn't read Chinese, so I didn't know where it was going. <laughs> right. And I got off after a while, and I was in a little village. This was a very remote area near... Mongolia, I believe. Um, but anyway, uh, I came across this little girl who was on the ground and she was playing with a stick and she was kind of doodling. And when she saw me, she stood up and was like petrified. She was shaking yeah. and she couldn't move out of her spot. I I mean, so, you know, they probably had never been visitors really yeah. to that area. It was very remote. They didn't, I don't think, had electricity. Mm. Uh, the houses were made out of tin and whatnot. Mm. So, anyway, um, I kind of eased over to her and picked up the stick and I made little doodles and eventually we kind of played around together making these little doodles and then the train was coming back and I got on the train and and so that's kind of how that happened and I when I was at the University of Utah um, this idea of um, creating a space for people where their creativity allows them to uh, supersede the barriers and boundaries that we put up with each other. I mean, art does it anyhow, mm -hmm. but we don't. Uh, we don't often. In 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 uh, what's the word? 
intentionally um, use it that way. It's a byproduct. When you go to see a performance or when you look at a painting, or uh, you get a sensation of freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Freedom from your thoughts of limit. And um, the first project that I actually did around that, uh, connected to that little girl, was I, I, I created a, a global poem for peace and um, asked people around the world to write poetry um, and send it to me and I would put it together in one big poem and lots of people, hundreds of people all over the world wrote. Uh, a lot of famous people wrote, Mother Teresa wrote, the Dalai Lama, uh, Jimmy Carter, um, and Leonard Bernstein wrote me this whole page poem <laughs> and uh, e eventually I sat with him uh, and he told me something that really switched my thinking about myself as an artist. He said, you know, the artists are the people who move society forward. And it reminded me of a scripture in Proverbs that said, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I thought, oh, the artist has the vision, really. And so anyway, that's how peace art became peace art. And so we would travel from country to country in small communities, working with groups in communities to create works of art, dance, sculpture, theater, poetry, whatever, and uh, use that as a tool to build community, to really bridge the barriers that people had or the, and the conflicts that ar arise uh, from those barriers. You know, it goes back to that little girl who, you know, I was an adult, she was a child, I was American, she was Chinese, the language, the culture, everything, all these barriers that we think we have with each other, but in some ways I connected more profoundly with this girl than I do the people I see every day. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to create that space for people. And I think my whole life has really been about that in all the different um, ways that I do things. Um, when I came back to Rochester, um, I came back, my dad had been ill, and, and so you're, I came you're back. from Rochester. And I'm from Rochester. Oh, okay. I grew Fantastic. up here. Oh, yeah, I grew up here. Wonderful. Left when I was, I don't know, 17 or 18, mm -hmm. go to New York. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was at Joffrey for a while. And Joffrey Ballet. Oh. Yeah, and then, and then I got an injury, and I, as, as life would have it, uh, I grew up here in an opera company. There was a company here called the Opera Theater of Rochester. I see. And okay. when I was seven or eight, I started in the children's chorus, <laughs> and I was in it till I was till I left. <laughs> you know, the adult chorus and everything uh -huh. else, and um, and so I knew a lot of the uh, people at New York City Opera because they were the people who came up. The directors and the oh. conductors and the singers were the people who came up to do the opera. So my whole life I've known. So I thought, well, maybe I should just go over there. And I eventually, when I injured myself, I didn't want to come back home. I wanted to stay in New York, and I found a way to do it by joining the chorus at New York City Opera. Fantastic. And so anyway, but uh, eventually I did come back and uh, got the job at RIT, uh -huh. which really did kind of, as everything does, kind of, you know, uh, mesh with what I was really doing, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm at NTID, and uh, so a majority of my, National, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. I see. Mm -hmm. And so majority of my students are deaf. Uh -huh. And so uh, when you are, what I really love about being there is, you know, sign language is its own non-verbal communication, right. its own dance, mm -hmm. in a sense, the language itself. And so the students really have an affinity already for movement. Mm -hmm. They understand the communication of movement. And so that's made it really a joy for me. In a way, like the uh, young Chinese girl that you didn't share language, you had to find a gesture, that's even right. if it's in the sand, to communicate. That's right. To build that bridge. Yeah. So, and you're at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, and do you teach classes there? Yes, yeah, so we have, um, well, when I can't, let's see, since I've been there, we, well, we teach jazz, ballet, modern dance, hip hop now, uh -huh. uh, dance history, and I used to teach a course on choreography, which we haven't taught in a while, but mm. that was a wonderful course too because I could intertwine very much the structure of uh, a, a movement phrase with sign language phrasing. Fantastic. So it was a really wonderful, and I always used to love telling my students in dance history, you know, American Sign Language is derivative of French Sign Language. And the French Sign Language really goes all the way back to Louis XIV's court, where, dan where ballet began. And the gestures in ballet uh -huh. were kind of 
adapted and in a sense became French Sign Language. So there's this whole long lineage uh -huh. between American Sign Language and ballet. Uh -huh. So anyway. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, yeah. uh, you started to speak about your father, and I oh, got us sure. off track, but that's okay. so pick up that thread if you don't So mind. yeah, so I come from a family of extraordinarily talented people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my father, uh, Robert Warfield, uh, son of uh, Robert Warfield Sr., um, who had been the pastor of Mount Vernon Baptist Church way in the beginning. Here in Rochester. Here in Rochester, New York. And uh, uh, my father, a uh, brother of uh, five brothers all together. Uh, and uh, he and my un uncle William. Uh, William Bill, Warfield, uncle the famous. Bill, the famous Arata. singer, mm -hmm. uh, went to Eastman, both of them. My father was a, uh, well, my father played every instrument, but he was a, a tuba and viola major. I know, I liked him for a reason. Oh, he was just, he, he was an extraordinary a musician uh -huh. and conductor uh -huh. uh, and singer. Uh, and, but my uncle, who then went off to become very famous for singing Old Man River and Showboat initially and then other things. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really surrounded by music. You know, I uh -huh. started piano at four. Oh my. So, uh, you know, it was if you lived in that house, <laughs> you were musical, no matter whether you were or not. <laughs> you were. But it, it's an interesting thing, though, that it seems, you know, because we always think of the, the talent as sort of this passed on. But actually, I think that it's less about talent and more about uh, nurturing. Mm -hmm. So how we are cultivated really, I think, has much more to do with who we become than the seed that's already there. It's really how you tend to that seed. Because I think, from my perspective, from my observation and experience, everyone has a spark of creativity. It's rather how that creativity is shaped or not. Mm -hmm. And um, and also how it is um, welcomed, you know? Because a, a lot of times, in, especially in this society, we don't think of creativity, well, on the same level as science and math and technology. And But actually, all of those things are creative. And so, <laughs> you know, you can't do any of them without a creative mind. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I uh, so yes, I was uh, I was in a family, and then my uncle married Leontine Price. So there was, and I was already in opera too. Oh, so uh -huh. there was this whole sort of uh, uh, a milieu of creative milieu people, of, yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah of, of art, of uh -huh. music, mm -hmm. music mostly. I I got sparked by dance in the opera. Uh, one day I was probably eleven, and I was I was in. Carmen, I believe, uh -huh. and and you know, in the one of the scenes, there's a dance that goes on, and I said to my mom, "Wow, I want to do that." <laughs> and she said, "Okay." You know, this is the wonderful thing about my parents; both of them were like this. Uh, you know, often you hear about your parents give you this idea that you can grow up and become anything you want, and my parents actually were more: you can grow up and become everything you want which is a little different yes. because it allowed me <clears throat> not to be focused too heavily in one thing, which nothing wrong with that, but for me, it's worked better that I was a little bit more broad. Mm -hmm. um, it's enriched my life uh, in mm -hmm. ways I can't even, you know, uh, Im have imagined. Uh, so um, I, <laughs> I guess I took them a little literally and did try to do everything. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. That's wonderful. Well, Rochester is a wonderful environment for that very welcoming. And it, but I wish that uh, the message of nurturing a young generation could be heard more loudly among yes, some, I agree. some households. Yeah, I, I agree. So uh, is this something that you bring to your teaching at NTID, for instance? Uh, oh, yeah. So my teaching is really about leading students to their own not even to their own creativity, but to their own nurturing of their own creativity. So it's, I think that education is really about um, finding how you learn and sort of teaching yourself that. Mm -hmm. So that well, no matter what environment it is, it could be your math class or your dance class mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it is, or your job, and you know how you need to be, uh, how you need to come at this to learn something. So if you can learn that while you're in school, uh, that's really a lifelong uh, education for yourself. But you take responsibility for that. 
And I think as artists, we kind of do this. This is how we're kind of taught anyway. I mean, as a, as a dancer in a ballet class, you have a teacher who kind of guides you here. But it's your body and it's your responsibility to make the instrument sing. If you're a violinist, you have an instrument, but you are actually the person who has to make the glorious colors in there. So I think that applies to everything, really. And in education, really, I think that that's, that's, the, that's the key, is to find how do we allow students to figure out how they learn and, well, want to learn. But I think you want to learn once you figure out that that's part of you. It isn't something outside that you adapt to or adopt. It's something that you release. That's how I look at it anyway. And so my teaching is a little bit like that. Um, I try not to really, you know, the teacher knows everything kind of mentality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where we're all kind of learning together here. And I bring something, and you bring something, and then we see what we have. Uh, so. <laughs> so recently, I had the opportunity to visit one of the classes at RIT where the oh. dance uh, instruction was going on. You didn't happen to be there that day. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, the fascinating uh, part about it was uh, the process involved. I wonder if you could offer your insights on how you teach that. Well, you, um, you know, people always ask me the question of how do deaf people dance. Mm. Because they can't hear they the can't hear the music. Well, of course, I always first thing I always say is dance isn't the music, <laughs> so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, though, really is there is a vibration to music, and so even if you can't hear the music, you have a sensation uh -huh. uh, of what that is. Yes. And so, for example, we have the speakers on the floor, and also speakers at the ceiling that come down. The sound comes, down. and so the vibration of that sound um, does have. What I like to say is it does communicate something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, know, I, I did a, well, this was years ago, but I did a little, uh, my own kind of non-professional research, I don't know, um, where I would switch the music and let the students move uh -huh. to how they felt. And if I put on, uh, you know, some soft violin music, they would sort of be this lyrical, uh -huh. even though they couldn't hear it. Uh -huh. And if I put on some African drumming music, there would be this kind of... Uh -huh. So to me, it really had to do with the vibration of the music and the messages sent through that vibration. Um, so that's a big, you know, but basically I don't teach the deaf students any differently than I teach the hearing students. I sign, so the communication in that sense. But you know, in dance, there's not a lot of verb verbiage. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly visual. Uh -huh. So um, the deaf students are already adapted to visual communication because that is how they communicate. Yeah. So you know, some I've noticed uh, over the years, sometimes in a performance, if um, students get off the count, they sometimes look to the deaf student. Oh. Now, it's a funny thing, you'd think it would be the other way around, yeah. but actually because the deaf students often have to internalize that rhythm so much. Mm -hmm. For us, we hear five, six, seven, eight, go. Yeah. But if you don't hear that, you have to actually internalize it a little bit more yes. so that you're in sync with it all uh -huh. the time. Yeah. Uh, so um, It's you know, quite organic. It's quite organic. Uh, there's that uh, famous percussionist, uh, Evelyn Glennie, yes, uh, right. who, who plays in bare feet. That's, so so she, she senses the sensation of the sound. Uh, and she senses the symphony orchestra behind That's her right. from the, the feeling on the stage. It's fascinating. Yeah. And so now uh, you and I serve on a board together yeah. called the William Warfield Scholarship Fund. And I, I'd just like to hear your um, reactions to um, his presence in your life and where you hope uh, those threads can lead? Uh, well, my Uncle Bill uh, and I were quite close uh -huh. uh, my whole life. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it's interesting in, the, in my family, there was never a lot of, hmm, what's the word? There was never a lot of, uh, talk around performing arts. Mm. <laughs> it's funny to say. Uh -huh. um, and so there wasn't a lot of that interaction. I see. So I didn't get a lot of, um, or this is good, that's not good, or do this or do that. I just kind of did what I did, and they kind of allowed me. Uh -huh. um, my dad, I would go to my father for little 
uh, he taught voice, so I would go to him. He never taught me, but <laughs> he, I would watch his, him teaching other people. And then I would, I would be on the piano practicing something, and he'd say, well, no, I think you should try this. Or, uh -huh. you know, uh, how does that feel if your voice went here or whatever? Mm -hmm. And so I would get little bit tidbits, you know, from him, and I'd ask him questions. And after I moved away, I would call him and say, you know, I can't get this phrase right, or I can't, you know. And then he would say, well, you have to do this, or, uh -huh. you know. So, uh, and it's funny, even now, he's been... He passed away in uh, 2001, oh, oh, 2000, uh -huh. yeah. So, I mean, he's been gone a long time, but even now I find myself wanting to ask him questions about, uh -huh. you know, with my uncle, um, we actually only performed once together, uh -huh. uh, and it was at the University of Utah. Oh, uh huh. Uh, he came to do something with the orchestra, and I was part of that, and... Uh, I mean, we would perform at the um, scholarship events together mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. but uh, they were more impromptu moments. Um, and I think I didn't really realize, he and my father, how proud they were of me until the end almost. Oh, that's a valuable thing to know. Because when he, when he wrote his autobiography, he gave me a copy and he wrote in the uh, You're talking about William Warfield. Well, yeah, William Warfield, mm -hmm. my, uh, mm -hmm. my uncle. Um, how proud he was of my accomplishments and the, well, the artist I'd become, and he had never said those things to me. Uh -huh. Even though you know you did feel it, but yeah. he never really said. And the same with my dad, said it just towards the end of his life, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and it was really a wonderful uh, feeling for me. A validation, uh, after validation all that time. after all that time. Mm -hmm. um, even though I know they loved me and that they, of course, were proud of me, mm -hmm. but uh, it was great to have that. So um, you know, in some way now. There, indirectly, mm -hmm. there were a lot of uh, wonderful things that happened just by having the name Warfield. <laughs> when I went to New York, oh, yeah. uh, I remember, especially at the state, when I went to the state theater, they have a, in the back, backstage, they have a little memorial to him or sort of, from when he was there with Showboat and other things. Wow. And so there's a little, like, um, uh, photo gallery <laughs> in the backstage, right behind the stage, and so people would tell people who had been there for the last 30, 40 years. You know, they had would tell me stories about him and, and things. And same thing. And then I did some things at the Met, uh -huh. and, the Metropolitan uh, Opera in New York. Uh -huh. Yeah, with mm -hmm. uh, Franco Zeffirelli. Oh, Franco. And um, <laughs> My. the the uh, the costume, the women in the costume, and and uh, uh, those people had been there for well since the old Met. Ah, uh, yes, uh-huh. Uh -huh. And they knew all of these stories about Leontine, and they would sit me down. I was like 18, and they would tell me all these stories about her. So in a roundabout way, um, you know, they were uh, connected to me in a, in a uh -huh. sense in, in my professional life. In my personal life, it was a different story. You know, there was family, and then that was one thing. Mm -hmm. The professional life was a very separate entity, really. I remember Leontine once told somebody... It got back to me, uh, San Francisco Opera, that, oh, I have a nephew who's very talented. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but she never ever said it to me. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but, uh, uh, so I didn't grow up with the expectation of that also. Yeah. So it wasn't a real thing. Uh -huh. um, what I took from them was their professionalism and artistry. Mm -hmm. And so that was very prevalent in my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, their mentorship of others. And their mentorship of others, that's actually right, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I kind of absorbed all that yeah, in right. a sense. Yeah. Now, uh, talk a little bit more about Peace Art uh, International, and that, that's Peace Art, P E A C E Art dot org, is that right? Yes, it is, correct. Mm -hmm. And it's um, an organization that basically it's an outreach organization uh -huh. that is both local and global in a sense because it does, we do projects all over the place mm -hmm. but the pro the idea of the projects really are um, well for example we went go into a community and I try to uh, meet with community leaders to figure out what kinds of things are going on in this community, what kinds of conflicts are there in this community that may need some addressing. Mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. example, one time we did a project in Raleigh, North Carolina years ago where there was a lot of racial tension. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, one of the ideas was to bring people together to create work of art. It's not really to address directly the issue. Mm. It's to allow people to come together and create a space where they build relationship. So if you're working on 
uh, in that particular instance, uh, dance together. Mm -hmm. Even though m most most people we work with are not dancers or not artists per se, mm -hmm. where they're just working using this as a tool. Um, and in, da in the dance. Uh, um, rehearsal, you've got to lift someone or you've got to pull them to the other side mm -hmm. or you've got, and so you begin to have this sort of sharing of um, a responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you rely on this person to mm -hmm. make sure they do what they do and you do what you do to make this work. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you're building a, re a relationship that you didn't have before. And once you sort of have a relationship with somebody, it's very difficult to bring back a barrier in front of, and put it in place. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And so that's really the work of Peace Art. Um, so that you can use, um, and I like to say creativity because sometimes when you say art, people get a little, I'm not an artist. Ah. So I, I just say just, well, the creative process, though, is where we are. It's like a fertile ground for building these relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one time I was doing a project in uh, 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 Sandpoint, Idaho. Sandpoint, Idaho. Mm -hmm. Really in the middle of the sort of Aryan Nation. Oh. Uh, they have a lot of the, a lot of the Aryan Nation and... Uh, uh, neo-Nazi groups, are, uh -huh. their headquarters are in oh, Coeur d'Alene, yeah. mm -hmm. right next door. To the, and so I remember the person ask, well, I was asking me, uh, well, you know, if you don't want to come here, we can understand, you know. I said, no, actually, I do want to come because I want to see if what I've been thinking is true is really true. Uh -huh. It's one thing to kind of be around similar thinking people. Right. It's another thing to actually not be around similar thinking mm -hmm. people. So anyway, I was in the uh, schools doing this project, and um, I remember the first day the students, an all white, pretty much all white town. Yes. Um, there were no there were no non whites in the school in mm -hmm. the kids classes. So the kids would not come near me. They would stand a good. 15 feet from me mm. and oh, wouldn't come close. So I would have to do everything kind of showing yeah. them. And then eventually they got closer and closer because, you know, of course, the relationships build. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And um, anyway, uh, towards the end of my time there, I thought, well, I didn't see any neo-Nazi groups or skinheads. Uh -huh. or, or. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then one day towards the, I think the second last day of my time there, I was walking down the street and I saw a teenage group of skinheads coming towards me. Uh -huh. And of course, my initial thought was to run into the store uh, and yeah. kind of hide. But then I thought, you know, I got to see if this is going to really work. Yeah. So they came up to me and they were very, they were just teenagers, yeah. but they were very intimidating and they surrounded me. Oh my. And I thought, oh, okay, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> and I said something like, well, I'm from New York and visiting. And one of them said, oh, I always wanted to go to New York. <laughs> and then the next thing I know, I'm asking them about, you know, what they want to do after school and da da da. And so our conversation totally uh, became this, well, almost a building of community. Uh huh. Um, just from the fact that I engaged not only their thinking, uh, their critical thinking, but I think even before that, their creative part. Because mm -hmm. the creative part, I think, really gives us an opening mm -hmm. to the world. All right. You know, where the clear, critical thinking often shapes the world. Right. But, uh, yeah. That's a wonderful thing. Well, you shape a wonderful world for us, Thomas. Oh, thank you so much for being my guest in the spotlight. Thank you for having me. I really You're appreciate it. You're a creative it. and a wonderful soul, and we're so <laughs> glad to have you in this community. We hope many people uh, enjoy your work at NTID and elsewhere. Thank, thank you so much. You.